So I um, I offered to be your tour guide for today, uh, and I mean that in the in the lightest version of the form tour guide because uh, <laughs> I, I I did go through the chapter, I did go I did create that little script for y'all to run, which didn't work. I had to update that script because <laughs> I left something out. Uh, or actually, I changed something, uh, thinking that I knew what was going on, and I didn't. So, uh, which which I'll point out in a bit. But um, what I thought I would do is um, walk through kind of what what they were doing. Uh, let me share my screen. Um, litter rip. So. Uh, yeah, we start at the top here. the 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 point of this chapter, as I as I typed in the in the, is this is this big enough? Can y'all read that? I want to just check that real quick. Ryan's mm -hmm. nodding. Everybody good? Yeah. Yeah. Now. If you can make it bigger, that would be better. Uh, come on. There we go. You have to scroll back up. Anyway, um, th this is the culmination chapter where I think the, all the pieces kind of come together. Um, we've, mm -hmm. we've looked at pre-processing methods, sampling methods, resampling methods. We've looked at different, a little bit different models. I don't think that this book is really, I think I, that was a mistake I made. I, I was kind of hoping to learn a little bit more about the individual models. Uh, but I think that is ISLR more which i signed up to join that book club last week um yeah that would be a, a good uh yeah that's what islr is it goes through all the actual models yeah yeah so <laughs> i'm gonna do this backwards as as is typical for me um i'm gonna learn how to use all the models and use them incorrectly and then learn how to use the models correctly and forget how to do them correctly so uh -oh. I'm, I'm, pre I'm prepared for that um so anyway, yeah. So this 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 chapter is all about kind of putting all those pieces together. Um, the this the I, I didn't really go through the the notes version very well. I mean, it's it's here on uh, on on the thing, but uh, um, they they use a different data set entirely. That's typical. Mm -hmm. I think they do that on purpose to uh, not step on the toes of the uh, of mm -hmm. the book book writers themselves from a from a copyright standpoint, which is which is fine. I think it's uh, nice to see it, yeah, with other data as well. I yeah, that's... that's really good too. I didn't get a chance to run the other data though. That's the only thing I wanted mm. to point out. Okay. Um, so uh, the key here is to uh, is is to do the basic stuff. They're loading up uh, the libraries. They're using uh, uh, the concrete data from the model data package, and it looks like it looks like this. And it's like you know concrete, and they're putting different stuff in it or not, and then how how that uh, how that how that cement holds up in terms of uh, durability or, or strength as measured by I'm not sure exactly what um, I do not know concrete very well no it's just the rest it, literally the mixture itself the the differences between the aggregate itself the, the lime that or not is it lime uh, calcium that is put in it's it's all a combination and depending on the ratios of those ingredients will give you different strengths of concrete so the measurement of this data set is just a, a reflection on what is the most optimal given certain parameters uh, you'll see this a lot in engineering construction civil engineering where they're selecting uh, bridge uh, uh, materials and building materials high-rise buildings etc this is a this is a common common practice. I do know. Side note, sidebar: Roman concrete, some of the strongest in the world. But they say that at the time when it was made, it wasn't that strong. It it actually aged into strength. Correct. Uh, you're thinking of the Parthenon, correct? The ceiling oh, it, of the Parthenon. Yeah. Very very hard stuff. All the aqueducts and everything too. So. Um, uh, the first, the first kind of part that they're doing is is very early on. They're taking the the split and they're using the 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 typical 75, 25 percent uh, training to test, and we're doing tenfold cross validation with five five repeats. I actually added that in my uh, in my version. 
to make that more expl uh, explicit. Uh, sometimes they, they go with the defaults and don't necessarily say that. Because I was like, 10 crossfold by validation, we're only doing five. But actually, the the folds is uh, is the v is the v um, uh, variable uh, within the function, and the repeats is uh, so they're doing 50, 50 samples here. Do I understand that right? Sounds Five by correct. ten. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds correct to me. Okay, and then uh, uh, creating those 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 data sets. Although remember, this is all lazy, so it doesn't create the data sets until later when it's actually run. Mm -hmm. um, they, they they talk here about um, uh, uh, normalization and and um, scaling. Some models require it and some don't. Um, and if and you, you don't mind me interrupting with that statement. So uh, for the group or for our team reviewing this book club, this this particular chapter, as we go further into the discussions of this, this is the first time that I'm witnessing a scratching my head at exactly what the author is trying to convey. I sidebarred with Frederica in this same comment. So the term sum of models, and then the other one is for other models. What I'm asking of this paragraph or of this next code block is, can you be a little more specific in which ones do and which ones don't um, in this relation? Because we have a huge quantity of different models to use. And it would be nice to define which ones are important and which ones aren't, or which one use these parameters and which ones don't. Mm -hmm. I'll come back and, and note a couple more times later in the chapter where this also takes place as well. Yeah, so, sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, I want to um, add something that uh, is, has been mentioned already about the, those, those things. Uh, but uh, here, they, the authors like to show you that you can use any models and assemble them all together and then uh, be able to see which one is the best one. So that's the purpose. That's, uh, it has been mentioned uh, even in other courses that we, we are just throwing uh, in uh, models uh, with nonsense. But uh, the, the, the purpose is that we want to scan through any type of models or and we don't do any type of model, we, we select. But, uh, like five no, linear model, five non-linear model. But then we do this for the, uh, uh, as demonstration that we can uh, put any models and then the right one will come up as the best one, basically. Okay, so something like that. Uh, and that's, 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 uh, that would be very important to do ISLR, so the introduction to statistical learning for understanding the differences within models. I guess that that was kind of the same thing I was saying a minute ago. It's like uh, uh, in this book in general, like they leave out the why you would use stuff, why you would do things a certain way and lean more heavily upon just this is the process you would use across different model types. Mm -hmm. I, I suppose that's. Yeah, I have the same problem with it, Ryan, eff effectively. <laughs> I would love a table that says, you know, for this type of data, use this kind of model, that sort of thing. But I guess that's not, or or, or in this case, use this type of centering and scaling uh, in order, this model requires this or not. Although I think the ta a table like that could be useful in this book, in this, in this uh, context, uh, really, really well. This is an appendix or Agree. something. Yeah. yeah. Table. Like a citation to ISLR where that where that uh, uh, where that particular model is expanded upon or 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 comprehension, right. etc. Yeah. yeah. They mentioned a couple of uh, of books where they uh, derive the those those knowledges. Uh, Oh yeah, the Kuhn, Kuhn and Johnson. Was it Johnson, Kuhn and Johnson? Kuhn. The applied predictive modeling. Yeah, yeah, 2013. I have a, I have that somewhere. I have the PDF. I need to dig it up. Yeah. It's a pretty good book, needless to say. But um, uses carrot, his old package. And well, it was written in a different time, right? 
yeah, yeah, exactly. It didn't. This package didn't exist when he wrote it. So now we have Parsnip. So um, effectively, there are some models that need the scaling and centering, and some that don't. And they're just showing roughly how to do that here, like mm -hmm. uh, um, creating two different kind of. Uh, actually, what are these? Can can someone help me? These are these are. This is a recipe. Mm -hmm. This is also a recipe. Yeah, I guess he typed the recipe to another recipe. Okay, yeah, yeah, it's kind of appended onto the end, but it's a separate recipe, so that you can run normalized and you can run the poly version of it. Yeah, so the normalized plus, I I assume he's saying like quadratic and two way interaction, so just like you know add squares of all the predictors and then add all the interaction terms okay and then here's where the uh where all the 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 types of models are defined uh it loads yeah. the rules and baguette package what can someone refresh my memory i remember the rules package but what was the baguette package doing other than like making me hungry for some fresh french mm. bread <laughs> Does anybody remember? I, I, I can't remember what baguette came from. Those model coaches were bagging. Oh, okay. Bag. I'm sorry, what? Uh, oh. <laughs> it's a pun, is what it is. Oh, it was for bagging. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's for bagging. Okay. All right. <laughs> That's a good laugh, too, I suppose. <laughs> So we've got the specifications for all these different models and they and they and the, you're setting the engine and you're you're setting some of the parameters that are required for those specific engines uh, uh, in, in the way that's that needs to be done. Um, again, I, I, I don't know all these model types and mm -hmm. what they do and don't do very well at all. Um, uh, SVM is what support vector machines, but the spec how the spec changes with I guess one is uh yeah what is mars i don't know oh wait we talked about mars early on did i miss that chapter oh dang. it was really really early on i and apologize I think, yeah this you this know ryan well no this this code block this this long list of different calls yeah. on our various libraries i'm assuming that we've covered them in the past 14 chapters to this point and i'm feeling at a disadvantage because i don't remember what all of these imply. Yeah. Um, this yeah, to me, you're, you're not disadvantaged at all. I no, this like... <laughs> to me, this screams mind map, right? Uh, uh, map uh, mm -hmm. exactly yeah. where you can find more information on these sections, etc. Um, I'm looking up the Mars definition real quick. Oh, cool. Thank you. Okay, now I know these random forest and XG boost. Yeah. Cubist. They I don't know what that one is either, but uh, but you know the the idea here is that these these models are like completely different. They come from completely different places. They come from completely different packages in some cases, um, oh, and we're gonna there. we're gonna run them all <laughs> on the same data, <laughs> as as I think Ryan pointed out, whether or not we should. <laughs> uh, chapter thirteen. Yeah, uh, Federica dropped something in the chat. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it's a um, multivariate adaptive regression spline. Ooh. Sounds that, like that, that, camp. Yeah, something that would 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 be needed before that is a like a quick visualization of the concrete elements that like with a scatter plot and everything just to see hmm. how they what, what their trend is and Okay. Oh, because then in the we, in the in the in the whatever the the yeah this this one they had a, <laughs> um, a correlogram. I thought yeah here to say like yeah what that, the that that's the note that's the note so <laughs> the, that's the course that made it. That's yeah. not the book. Yeah no but like is that what you're talking about like where you actually look at the data first rather than just run the models like crazy. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe that would be a little bit more clear that you might need to uh, to do a polynomial of uh, inside the model uh, to manipulate the data 
with a polynomial, and that because you use the the set poly, for example, when you make the uh, the, the, the second recipe, recipe. Uh -huh. <laughs> so in a way that you can uh, maybe adapt better uh, the model line to data. Okay, so you can do like a linear model with observed data, then you can make manipulation, do a log or a polynomial or so uh, different type of uh, scaling. Uh, okay, so that, that makes your um, model different. If you, if you assemble these steps differently, you, you have different models. So that would be interesting to have a visualization, quick visualization of the trend of the main uh, thing. And then just to see that the polynomial would be important, maybe. Yeah, for sure. I, yeah, so we've skipped, I, you know, I think uh, in this case, this chapter, as we've, we've said, is that it's just to show how to put all these pieces together not necessary to explain like right. i guess what you should really do which is actually look at your data uh before you model it <laughs> uh <laughs> skipping the important <laughs> parts you know and that's and that's okay I, that's the that's the purpose of the i think that's the purpose of the chapter um so um and then the next part is about like putting stitching everything together and so in this case, you're, you're saying, well, OK, what are the ones that need to have centered and scaled data? Uh, and you you give it that pre-processed data set and you say what models use that spec. And so those 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 go into the normalized one. Um, and then you can look at and you can see that that's in a tibble and then you can look at that tibble and you can or you can pull out a specific uh, a specific model. And take a look at it and make sure that all of the steps are what you want them to be um i'm sorry this is uh, a little bit small you blow things up a little bit and they uh they take over so um and then here they're adding uh they're adding some parameter information so there was that little blurb at the bottom of the previous one where uh, Kuhn and Johnson's book said that they needed to set the hidden units of the neural network model to have 27 hidden units in a layer, um, and so they're adding that. They're adding that here. This is actually where I screwed up. The initial, the initial version of my uh, of the script that I uploaded, where I had cut all this stuff out. Uh, I thought that this was actually the when when I scroll up to that part. Um, I put I had put these uh, these parameter parts as part of the spec because I thought that it, it, these were the same thing in that spec and in that param, and they are not. So you give it the yeah. you give it the parameter, and and in, in a separate place. Yeah. Uh, now that uh, I'm doing introduction to statistical learning, um, uh, as a book club as well. I understand a bit more, okay, since I, um, I did this chapter uh, for the previous course. And as you can see, when he said the hidden units for the neural net, this is, uh, this model specification is the neural network, okay? So, and they use the hidden units as a parameter for this specific model because the neural network uh, provides some hidden units. So in, in a un, uh, neural network model, you have an underneath uh, function, like, um, that, like an underneath structure, which is already made, and you build up your model on top of that. So in this case, they are establishing that these uh, units are of these numbers from 1 to 27. So this get inside the meaning of different type of models. But I did it without any knowledge and that was useful to me to, to see how it works when, when using different models. I just took them as different within each, each other and then that's it. 
So I I can use this stuff. Mm -hmm. I'll send you my concrete model tomorrow. Cool. Anyway, um, so we 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 created the workflow set for the things that got normalized. We then also create the workflow set for things that do not require normalization. So these are these uh, XG boost and random forest and all that stuff. Um, so th they called that no pre-proc, um, no, pre no pre-processing. And you can see that we have effectively the normalized list and the no, no pre-proc list. And then I think the next step is to put that, oh no, there's another one with features. So we create that one too. So now we have uh, 12 models total that we're going to run on our data set, but they're all in three different places. Um, what they do is they, they just bind those rows together and everything, everything is uh, all together. So we still haven't run anything yet, uh, according to this. Like We don't have any outputs, um, but we have one option listed for the, the neural network. Um, and that was the parameter, lit, the, param the the hidden unit thing that we just talked about. Um, and then the, here's where we uh, here's where we start to, to to dig into it. So there was there was well, this is the part that this um, there was a uh, a grid control in here. There's grid control, and then grid results. If you run this, the workflow map is going to run the models. Uh, and it's going to save the results back to grid results. Um, and, uh, uh, but they, re they repeat that again here and then they time it, which was unfortunate because like you literally are running the workflows twice uh, <laughs> with slightly different, uh, uh, I actually, I, I'm pretty sure they're, they're like almost exactly the same. 1503 concrete folds sorry i'm scrolling because i can't see but it's just because of the zoom controls you you guys you, you, you add see. you add something here in the verbose. control verbose i think yeah yeah and control is there grid is there resample so it's just verbose and then you're timing it so i don't know why they did this where you literally if you were to just copy and paste this without really paying attention you'd have to wait for two hours for this to process and then do it again to time it and have verbose hey, uh, now now i remember wh why these things happen because can you see here in the control gr grid control uh -huh. bit here you now say are saving the prediction save pred through and save workflow too uh that's something that is did it uh, as well before so no i thought it was that yeah the results show that the option result comments have been updated i guess i guess if you because what because it's they true because have... once you run this it updates the it updates the result to have the results um so it should actually be there so this the workflows right they don't have results but if you look at the results, you can see that this is, I've already run this, obviously, like this, mm -hmm. I couldn't do this live. Uh, mm -hmm. It would take too long, but like uh, the, yeah, you see that the result has been updated. One thing they pointed out is that if it f fails, um, it would be an X here instead of a plus um, and those sorts of things. Um, the, while, so last night when I didn't have KNN, the package KNN, and I didn't have XGBoost installed, it um, it gave, it like just, I didn't have verbose on either, but it gave me a line that said, you don't have package KNN skipping. So it won't fail if you don't have a package installed, but what I, one thing I was unsure of is that, let's say that I did that, right, unintentionally, and it skipped it. Is there a way to run that one model? It's because this is all set up to just run through the whole thing. Like I couldn't, I didn't, I admit I didn't spend very long on it, but it's like, you know, let's say you skipped it by accident and you installed the package to run it. Could you just run that one line? There's got to be a way to do it. I just didn't, I didn't, I didn't see how. Um, and have it store it back into the, into the tibble. Um, there, there is a way to see one of these models 
selecting them from from the list but then but to run that run one only and uh, save it back to the same tibble yeah you can, you can do it separately you can do it yeah. separately you get you can you do could, it yeah yeah and then bind it, it. okay so uh, this is what it looks like uh, i can scroll up and show you what mine looked like uh it for me it all just comes up in red uh just because of the way i have my color set up on my uh on my r console you can see here like it's uh it's it tells you that it's doing tuning and tells you that it's doing the model and tells you roughly how long it takes and that's really cool i think um and then it tells you that it's done uh all right so uh and then, and then once you have your results it's all about like trying to figure out how um you know which one's the best fit because at this point we're not really sure um and you can see here it looks like uh for the most part if you're using rmse as a as a as a, as a ranking mechanism i'm assuming a boost tree is probably must be the xg boost model um showing that it has the lowest uh, RMSE and you can see which which model and which preprocessor part that came out of. Um, stop me if uh, if I'm add 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 useful information that you may be aware of because again I'm I'm the tour guide but I don't know the area. <laughs> Worst tour ever. <laughs> so, uh, so, that, so then you can you can plot that out as well and see kind of you know roughly how the models do overall in terms of. So this is the I guess the uh, uh, it's the RMSE, but it's um, it's giving you the statistics on the on the all the different runs of the model. So you can see that the KNN performed. Uh, the worst and the the boosting model perform the best if RMSE the lower the number the better I assume and you can see kind of what everything else is in there too uh, so Cubist did pretty well even though we don't know what that is or I don't know what that is um, and you can see the difference between radial and poly uh, for the support vector machine um, that the the radial version of it did better for some reason uh, right. this is all really cool I just don't yeah, know what it I, all means. <laughs> I I looked up Cubist just a second ago. It it looks like it builds a tree of models. So it says, and then the output is um, a list of rules. And it says, you know, if your variables have, they're in this range, use this model. If they're in this range, use, and it's like a, a linear regression at each uh, node. So that was new. I didn't know about that <laughs> until today. So that's interesting. Here, I'll, I'll, I'll drop in the chat what I found. There's a package in R, not surprisingly. Oops. So you can, you can hone in on a particular model uh, that you want by the, its ID. Uh, so you take the, do, use the autoplot function, which is, outputs a ggplot2 object. You can pull in uh, uh, one particular model and look at the outputs of those things. Um, again, I'm not I'm not 100% sure what I'm looking at, other than these are the performance metrics of many models mm -hmm. from the Cubist trees, as Steve indicated, um, and then what we saw in the previous plot. Um, I'll do quartz and of course I ran the wrong one. Mm -hmm. um, I assume you're looking at like, so if this is the cubist output, you're looking at all of these. This is the average of all of the RMSEs of all of these across the nearest neighbors and committees. Mm -hmm. Uh, which makes sense because it's like, I don't know, four point. Well, that's five. Actually, it doesn't make sense because this is this is like 4.7 to 5.5.6 .5 or something like that. The average should be a little higher mm -hmm. than that. So I don't know. 
it's okay. What 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 is committee? I don't know. <laughs> it's a part of the this thing. So it's like it's a, like an ensemble. So they they do just a lot of uh, the trees of models and then kind of combine them. So it's like a it's like a fancier random forest or something like that. Yeah, yeah, kind of conceptually. All right. I feel like I'm going to have to go read this after we have our meeting. <laughs> yeah. But again, I you know, like I said, the the chapter is thin on the details on why you would choose or not choose mm -hmm. particular models. I, I, I'm I'm pretty sure that ISLR or some other book is going to give us the details on that, or or, or the 2000 what 2013 2003 book by Kuhn and Johnson probably has a lot of details behind there too. I think so. Um, even if it doesn't I use these modern tools. ISLR, but I have an earlier version. So, so, so uh, the second phase of this is to um, it uses uh, uh, race tuning to uh, instead of running all twenty, I think it's twenty-five thousand models. It runs a subset of them and tries to find the 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 minima or the maxima. I forget what what exactly we're aiming for here. Uh, and I think it said somewhere further down that it runs something like uh, four thousand instead of. So it's like eighteen percent of the total gauntlet of models that we're requesting, uh, and and yet it and it takes. Uh, I think uh, I didn't time it, but they said it takes. Um, like 30 or 40 percent of the time of running all of the models more 4.6 fold faster is yeah. the comment so uh, so but you know and then and then the point of this is to kind of well okay compare uh, compare those outputs uh let me let me just pop so this is the original one um I should save this to him. Maybe we can. So this is grid results. So we'll just save this to. Uh... And then. Um... And this is the race results. So we'll call this race plot. That sounds not very nice, but. Race plot, yeah. <laughs> um, and then. Um... Uh, what do I need? Put them on the same place. So that may not be helpful. Might have been better to pull them out. Uh, but you can see roughly the order is mostly preserved. You can see here that the the bottom is the the race tuning, the top is the the grid tuning, and uh, you can see the the order is roughly preserved. There's a couple that are a little out of order when you when you uh, so you can see that the results will turn out differently based upon how many how many of the total models. But considering that the order is roughly kept the same, the fact that these are probably not really that different from each other since the right. The bars overlap, right? Uh, as a as a very crude metric, uh, and well, boosting boosting wins in both both cases. Yeah, I mean it's good to see that. Yeah, the top five is the same in in both. Yeah, that's kind of reassuring. I don't know if it's just this case, but <laughs> it seems, looks like seems it good. gets a bit muddled in the middle. These three kind yeah, of swap those around. Are just, they they overlap a lot. So yeah, I think that's just sampling will cause it to flip. Yeah. So, um, so actually, that's that's kind of the point of the of of this next part, where they're 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 taking the results and they're mm -hmm. they're looking at everything together, and they're seeing you know how how they compare to each other in terms of uh, a one to one uh, line, um, and and you can see that some of them. Most of them are performing very close one to one to one, even with the different resampling. 
uh, that's being used and the different number of models being run. But there's some of them that seem to be, you know, that that are, I guess, more sensitive to that, uh, particularly the support vector radial and the, uh, what was the MLP one? Multi-layer perceptron. Oh, okay. So real simple yeah. uh, uh, neural network neural sort of thing, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. And then, and then the last part is just about kind of like, okay, you've run this, uh, what, what are the, what are the, you know, how, how do you pick the best one? Well, you, okay. You just, you, you extract the work workflow set that's boosting and then you select. So you've made the decision based upon the previous plots to say, well, the boosting is winning, you know, for whatever reason, uh, and you're going to go with XG boost. And you're going to select out the best model based upon the, the the lowest RMSE, and then it gives you that model. And you can see actually that my I don't know what if I, what I did different. I guess it's random to some degree, but my my trees and my my depth and all that stuff is a little bit different than theirs, even though I ran it the same code. It, I don't think it should be different because aren't we aren't we Didn't setting you change the seed? I'm sorry, what? what? Sorry, what did you say, Federico? Didn't you change the grid number? The seed or, or? The grid. How greedy it is? The grid is. <laughs> the, grid, the, the grid number uh, in the workflow set. I don't know. Where would I see that? um what what section was that in i mean i literally pretty much copied and ran, ran it from here so i i don't think i changed anything intentionally okay now uh, that there you go because i've changed this to a lower number to do that faster so I don't yeah. know if you, did so, you use so, the 25? No, I did, yeah, yeah. And it took, uh, I think it took 40, 45, 50 minutes, something like that to run. Yeah, I tried not to change anything, just to just to kind of keep it as much. Uh, and I said, well, I'm just going to run it overnight. So, but yeah, here, so this is what I ran. So the seed is the same, 1503, grid, grid size is 25. And everything, yeah. I, I yeah, it, I just found that really interesting because they they say their outputs are this and mine are 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 just slightly different. Let me copy that over. So you can see the the numbers there are different, but so yeah, I don't know. But that's expected, I suppose, you know, the, the difference. And if you remember the difference in the model, the model outputs, the RMSE for like model six versus model 11 was like these tiny little fractions of an RMSE. So like, and the top, I think, what was it? Five or six models were XG boost models. So honestly, if you were to go with any of those, you'd probably get more roughly what you want. Uh, that's my interpretation. But I'm just a I'm just a statistician uh, by by nighttime. So uh, and then the last the last thing is to just uh, you're 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 just selecting that model. You're finalizing the workflow and uh, and and doing that one last thing on the uh, you're running it on the actual test data, I believe, right? So it's a pretty good fit and you can take that and then you're you're plotting the output and looking at how well that line fits. Must have my DPI very high. These po the points are very different different shape. So 
So that's so to me, that's the whole point of the chapter is to just show, okay, we're gonna we're gonna do these different things and we're gonna take these workflows, we're gonna put them all in one and we're gonna run and we have to do that because some of these need centering and scaling, some of them don't, some of them need a polynomial function or shift, some of them we want the interaction effects and some we don't and so on and so forth. And they're just showing us how we can put all that together and then run everything at once, compare the outputs of the model. And then, and then finally make a selection, and then run the model on our on our actual uh, test data. Take those outputs, look at the outputs, and and move forward or not with the selection of the model that we like the best. Mm -hmm. That to me is chapter fifteen. Well, thank you. Um, I think. I think it. I think that I was have, a good tour. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank this, you. Yeah, it was your tour guide. That was your tour for today of chapter 15. I Thank learned some for, stuff. <laughs> Thank you for coming to the castle. Yeah, for sure. Um, I hope that was helpful. It was. It was, hel it was helpful for me. I find that I actually pick up more when I actually have to talk about it. <laughs> right. I think that's true in general. Like. Oh, no, that's always a good thing to do. Yeah. Oh, I, okay. I, no, yeah. I, I, I have one more comment, if you don't mind, uh, Frederica. The thought that I had during reading, and maybe I'm, I'm, I'm working on being as accepting as possible of the, of the team's thoughts of, of the summary of chapter 15, my question would be, when reading or interpreting this structure of Mr. Kewen and, and Miss Julie, when she's, uh, Sylvie, when she's writing content, interpreting the paragraph, um, interpreting the sentence of what they're pointing at or what they're trying to convey. And I, I, maybe it's me and I'm, I'm again, I, I will take that on as my own personal uh, uh, hurdle to overcome. As I read this chapter, I continually had to stop, pause and think, what are they trying to get at here? Mm. Now, as you look at the collective whole and Frederica to support your statement at the beginning and, and Brandon, you definitely conveyed that was we don't know where we're going yet, but we've got some data and we can use the tidy models and we're gonna plug all of this in and burn some electrons and the computer will tell us what the most optimal path would be. And then at the very end of the chapter, we have our grid search versus our race method. And as a comparison, which would be more optimal, how more efficient can I not burn electrons or heat up my office with computer processing? My question to the team or my question to this cohort, this group is reading chapter 15 was cumbersome because of the constant relation of going back and, and reciting or re, remapping what we have. Mm. In the middle or the first 15 minutes of our conversation, I was making the comment of the mind mapping and or the, the citation. We talked about a table point, pointing us at why we would use this model or, or taking us what this model implies. Did anybody else find that same uh, feeling through this? And Brandon, I very much appreciate you uh, being the tour guide or, 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 or going through this anyway. Yeah, for sure. I felt very much the same. Like, uh, I, I've had to kind of give up a little bit cause I realize I don't have the, the statistical background to actually understand why you would choose or not choose or why you would, I, I understand a little bit why you would normalize center and scale, that sort of stuff. But like these models, I've never used anything like them before. You know, most of the time, linear regression or maybe nonlinear regression, that's about as far as I've gone. Um, I've never really had to use anything else, uh, but I'm starting to to have a lot more data from like I work in a I work in a, a vertical farm. And so, like, we we have tons of data and no one. I, they're kind of looking at me and going, well, you're you're the computer guy. You you must know mm. how to do some of this stuff. And and so that's why I'm actually that's why I'm kind of here to but also for mm -hmm. personal personal reasons. Sure. When I, I'd really just like to understand this stuff better anyway. But I, totally. I've had to just like disconnect and say, I'm not going to know what this shit 
is, <laughs> but at least I'll be able to run it, um, well, you know, for now. And that's why I joined the ISLR because I was like, well, I clearly uh, don't have the background to do this. And so I need to learn more about it. But I, right. I, agree, with, I agree with you. Previous chapters, I, I drowned myself trying to figure everything out and uh, I just I, I couldn't do it anymore. I didn't have the time. Here you just kind of let go, went with it. Yeah. yeah. It's hard. Yeah, I think you should do it. Because I like to learn everything, so, you know. Yeah. I feel like um, the ISLR will uh, help a lot. Because, yeah, basically that's what that is. It just says, here's these kinds of models. Here's these kinds of models. Here's these kinds of, yeah, so. It, but is there is there why, well, Steve? Like, why uh, you would want to use that type? That's, that's a good point. Um, I mean, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, honestly, I don't think there's a lot of a lot of the why <laughs> for sure, but um, it does tell you. I think sometimes it will say, "Well, it performs well in this situation," or it performs, you know, well in this situation. I mean, it's like you know, we talk sometimes about linear, mo linear models. It's always like, "Well, what are the assumptions of the linear model?" <laughs> so, so, so as you learn the different models, you can learn, you know, well, this works well, but these things have to be true about my data. Yeah, so I, I think it does help a little with that, sure. I would say it's not a, it's not a, it doesn't give you a why question. It's more of a how question uh, or, or a how statement. So yeah, here's your model, work. here's your instruction. This is how you apply that. It would be up to us as the author, developer, statistician, data mm -hmm. scientist to choose why we're going to go that route. Does that make sense? The, yeah. having a foundational comprehension of that model and what its capabilities are or the efficiencies of that model. And then right. given the, the data set, why we would go down that path. So the, 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 the how is what ISL, ISLR does. Um, the why right. would be up to us. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, it, I like if you know what's going on under the hood better, yeah, you will, it, you'll get a little more intuition for that kind of thing. Where you say, okay, yeah, here's here's something where I need a random forest. That's gonna work for me. Yeah, yeah I think um, yeah. ISLR is a bit heavy book. Yeah. Uh, so to to do it well, you should read it properly, each chapter and everything. Then uh, meditate on each chapter and each page and each uh, formula, and then you will get the most. So it, that that's and, and that that's sold as a uh, middle uh, middle road between the theory and uh, um, a road manual. So that that's in the middle between these two, but still it's a that's a lot of lots of theory. So, and then just a few examples. So I think that, that would be useful to have more practical parts on, in there. Uh, but, you know, if you run the labs, at least you can understand a few things mm -hmm. and then uh, skim through the, the theory. But the most you, you gain reading and meditating to each page each book is uh, each chapter each formulation yeah. otherwise yeah i was just i posted um, a, a link in the, in the chat oh. and it's um it's a website i used to use a lot more it's it's frequentist positioning of like if you have this kind of data what sort of model should you oh, choose okay. and even yeah. here's here's some example r code SAS code data SPSS. Use the correct statistical test. Okay. Yeah. 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 And that I've used that in the past quite a bit to kind of finagle my way through um, a question that I had using some data that wasn't standard or, or was categorical or was ordinal or something. But like, I wouldn't say that I understood fully what I was necessarily doing either. But a table like to, to me, this is kind of what I think I'm searching for. Like, you have this kind of data nice guidance yeah this is what you should do like mm -hmm. and this is why you should do it um they do they do when you go through the code it explains a little bit more but like um i helped the the one of the guys uh, his name was josh he wrote who wrote this mm -hmm. page with the us ucla professor that he was working with um he um 
I was helping him with some ggplot2 stuff way back, and mm -hmm. I've kept I've kept this page in a bookmark uh, for a long time. <laughs> Well, I, I, I wanted to pose a question to the group. So in another conversation, different book club, way, 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 way back a year ago when it all started, um, I was interacting with another member and I said, would it be, this is very philosophical, would it be the requirement of a data science person or data analytics, data processing person, statistician, you have no idea what the data is, right? Well, you 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 just get this set of information, these you know categorical or or numeric values, etc., and and you need to process and give us a assumption of what your uh, uh, using your methodologies, using your different models of of how you would uh, associate. Tell us some information about this data, right? You have no idea what the background is of the data, and I pose the question saying that. Technically, as a data scientist, we really should be agnostic to the uh, how the data was derived, because we need to model it to determine whether it's efficient or not. So you could go back to the person that's collecting this information and say, "Yeah, you got a really crappy, unhealthy system, and maybe you should tune it this way, or you know, change these parameters, whatever the case may be." Your census data or your your questionnaire that you're asking them isn't quite accurate. Maybe we could change the uh, question you're asked, uh, the answers you know, provided back from the from the uh, person taking the survey. Does that make am I am I making sense with this this kind of placement of being this analytic person? You should be agnostic to the derivatives of where it's coming from, but then that's what chapter 15 is doing, right? It's just kind of like shotgunning the broadside of a barn and saying, I don't really know what we're going to do here, but we're just going to let the computer figure it out. I like that <laughs> analogy, by the way. But then, well, but then is that is that my is that a good assessment of of what this is doing? Sorry. No, uh, it's a good question. I don't. I don't have an answer for sure. I'm not. I'm not poking fun at anybody. I'm not poking fun at the chapter. I'm. I'm actually just asking a very. I don't know. Am I? Am I? It, it, forming my opinion. Am I accurate in how I would go about this? Um, <laughs> nothing has. Nothing has swayed me from my my direction yet. I, I still have this this hidden thought that. Uh, yeah, none of us really know what we're doing. We just know how to use the tools to get us the answers we're looking for to take us to the next step. So yeah, honestly, that's kind of what I want. Yeah, and I don't. I don't feel like I. I used to feel like I had to know absolutely everything about everything in order to use stuff, but it's impossible. Um, as I as I aged. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's the big literally data. Yeah, that's the what big it's data. come from well yes also that like there's so much data now that like right i think the more you know the more helpful it is but yeah i mean at a certain point um it's kind of like how deep do you want to go down that rabbit hole so i'm gonna shotgun the hell out of my barn <laughs> and, and well, i'm gonna, okay, so I'm gonna move forward is what i'm gonna do ryan <laughs> I, and the statistician who like Federico is going to come along and tell me what I did wrong. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of potentially uh, sac sacrilegious, right? But I've heard people say, well, if we had had all this computational power in the past, statistics would probably be very different because, mm -hmm. yeah, a lot of things you do in statistics is based on dealing with the limitation that maybe you didn't have a lot of data, maybe you didn't have a lot of power. But now you could do like, okay, th throw it at the, you know, Markov chain sampler. Here you go. Woo, Monte Carlo, go for it. And then you can get, you know, really good results potentially just based mm -hmm. on that computational power. I was going to finally add one last thing. So I tell all, all staff members, all uh, uh, peers, anybody that I interact with, size is not important, right? It doesn't matter how large your data set is or it doesn't matter how many variables you're you're you know calculating with or you know how efficient this or not efficient but uh, uh how much data you're collecting right uh, the, the the size of the the data set and uh the the reason that i i continually say size isn't important is because now you can apply a model that will nullify that right yeah i've got a million variables in this data set only 15 of them are important Right. So I can I can exclude all of that based on this use of selection or based on this selection, uh, sorry, based on this 
optimized statistical method saying that these mm -hmm. are the more important variables. Um, yeah. There's always a reason why you don't, why you're limiting. What I find often happening, at least in the current field that I'm in, is that staff members will immediately focus on this one single instance and exclude all other data. Like they will actually limit themselves. They will cut mm -hmm. off information. I'm like, oh, no, that's taboo. Don't do that. Right. Yeah. Figure out statistically why you're selecting those as an exclusion. Don't just arbitrarily, you know, uh, uh, slice them off and say, okay, I'm going to ignore these because I'm still trying to figure out. That's like a, an Excel spreadsheet method of, of you know, yeah. sorting, pivot table type sorting. I'm like, that's not stats. That's not analytics. Yeah. But, but I will say from, from a non, non statistician point of view, too, yeah. we, we have a shit ton of data here, too. But like, is that data? good yeah that's that's so like <laughs> you can run statistics all day long but if your data is not useful it's true is that like it doesn't it doesn't make say it doesn't measure exactly what you think it measures and you don't know that until you start asking more questions right so that's where you need you don't just need you know root statistical power and tools and computation you need you need to understand. So back to your point earlier, you were like, well, yeah. what if they didn't tell you anything about your data? I'd say they're doing it wrong. you got to know what your data is, right. where it came yes. from yeah. and who right. who yeah. took the samples and like, did they analyze it in the right way or, or and so on, you know. And I, I, I answered that. So Sandra yeah. was, was who was I was interacting with. And she goes, no, you have to at least know where it's coming from or, you know, yeah. what the what the population is or, you know, the, the min max values of yeah. what you're entering. Yeah. So, you know, if it's good or bad. Uh, yeah, yeah. That that and going back to the which model do you use uh, situation. Um, it definitely comes into play that, yeah, your, your data will determine that. So like, you know, if you have like a lot of zero values in your data, then you'd say, oh, I, I want to use the zero inflated, you know, method or the negative, but yeah. So I, I feel like you always got to have awareness of your data for sure. As a, as a final thought to keep in the back of your mind, I, also compare statistical modeling or the use of these various packages, uh, libraries, uh, access, et cetera, as you have a hammer or you have a screwdriver, okay? Mm -hmm. So users that wanna do home repairs may not have the resources to accomplish that home repair. So you pay for a contractor to come in that has a whole wealth of different things, or you right. take a vehicle to a, to a mechanic that has access to a wider array of tools to accomplish a job. Then you measure the efficiency, which would be the quality of the tools, right? Um, are you buying you know, a, a lower end model uh, of, of tool set, or are you going to the extreme of you know, precision tools that you know, are extremely efficient? You'll get the job done faster. Right. I, maybe these are all bad analogies, but in my mind's eye, that's why I, I'm guiding users in this direction of, yeah, that's not a good plan. Don't go down that rabbit hole because that's <laughs> not going to work. You want to go over here and do this instead and use these tools. Um, you need a different tool set. You need, you need a, a how to use the tool. Um, using a, a socket wrench to hammer a nail into a wall would be the, an, an inappropriate use of tool. So just but, an example. But I've done that. <laughs> right. I think all it of us did. have, right? It worked. <laughs> Not great. Use the side. The, side yeah. the comment is if the tool works, use it kind of concept. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. <laughs> so excellent. Thank you very much, Brandon. So we'll see you um next week with uh, someone else doing these things like who is uh, me <laughs> uh who is the the next one um uh, so it's me encoding categorical data okay. next week we'll see that with some uh, uh hopefully uh some changes from the previous court and about us, nothing. So we need more volunteers for the next chapters. So anyone who would like to present uh, uh, any one of the remaining chapters that would be uh, very useful. 
and uh, that's all. Thank you very much for attending this session. Thank See you, you next week. Bye. Ciao. Bye bye. Ciao, ciao.